Okay, so there are various clearing up things that we want to do. One of which is, uh, the, the main thing we're going to talk about today is angular momentum. Okay, but before that, uh, um, I want to tell you about the law of motion for uh, uh, photons in a more uh, elaborate way than saying that they move along uh, null GD6. Okay, uh, in the sense that what we want to do is to record not just how the photon moves, but how its wave vector changes as it moves. Okay, and uh, the principle we're going to use is the following. We should really be doing this by an analysis of Maxwell's equation. Uh, but you get the same answer by analyzing a massless minimally coupled scalar field. So we'll just do that. It changes very little. It's a property of the wave equation. Okay. So you consider the action S is equal to del phi, the whole thing squared. So massless minimally coupled scalar field. The equation of motion that follows from this action is del squared phi is equal to zero. Okay? So in curved space time, there's a root g, and this is del squared the actual del squared in, in curved space time. Okay, now let's try to find solutions of this equation in some approximation. Okay, so what we're going to do is to set pi is equal to e to the power i times s. Okay, so if we set phi is equal to e to the pi i times s and then we just compute, so it looks del mu phi. This is equal to i del mu s times e to the pi i times s. And so del square phi is equal to minus del s the whole thing squared plus uh, i del squared s into e to the pi times s. The whole thing is into e to the pi times s. That's clear, right? Okay, now let us remember, um, let us remember, uh, what, uh, suppose we were just in flat space, okay? If uh, we were just in uh, flat space, then the kind of solutions we'd have for this equation, we know the basis of solutions would be e to the pi k dot x where k squared was equal to zero, okay? So we want to search for solutions sort of like this solution. Now, of course, solutions like this solution, exactly this solution doesn't exist. But you could imagine that you've got some curved space curved on some length scale L. Okay. So L is the space, curvature of the space. And we want to search for solutions that look like this with KL much, much greater than 1. Okay, which is the same thing as L much, much greater than lambda, where lambda is the wave, wavelength of your photon. So if I've got this box whose size is small compared to L but large compared to lambda, in such a box solutions like e to the pi k dot x ex exist in appropriate coordinates. Okay, so I want to search for solutions like that, solutions that will in little boxes become e to the pi k dot x. So that's my goal. And I, uh, we're looking at some, oh, our space is curved on some length scale n, and we're probing it with photons that are much smaller than that length scale, whose wavelength is much smaller than that length scale. Okay, this is the kind of thing we want to study. Okay, uh, if you study the motion of photons or gravitons or whatever, whose wavelength is comparable to the size of the space, then none of my approximations will work. But if we study it, this is what's called the geometrical optics limit. Uh, in the limit where the wavelength is much smaller than the size of the space, everything I'm saying will work. Okay, so you see, suppose we go to some local coordinate, locally flat or approximately flat coordinate system there. Then in that locally flat coordinate system, approximately, S will be sort of like k dot x. Right? Now what can we say about S? About what can we say about del mu S? So del mu s, exactly, would be like k mu. And what, what about del squared s in this approximation? It's equal to zero. So in the approximation in which we're working, now of course del squared s will not really be zero. 
But what this shows is that for our solution, del squared s will be estimated by 1 over l squared. In the approximation where it's where the curvature is gone is zero. Okay? So del squared s will be sort of like one over l squared. And del s, the whole thing squared, will be like one over lambda Exactly, k squared, one over lambda squared. So in this approximation, okay, in this approximation we would expect we would expect del squared s to be much, much less than del s, the whole thing squared. Is this clear? Okay. Now, let us try to physically interpret this condition. I mean, we've done some interpretation, but let's say it yet again. Del s, as we have explained, is a measure of the, or del s the whole thing squared, um, uh, you know, del s the whole thing squared, this is sort of like k squared. Okay? And this is like derivative of k squared. Del squared is 1 by l squared or lambda over 1 by lambda l Maybe there's a term which is lambda over l. Perhaps there's also a term. It's true. Yeah. It, it could be that there's a term that's lambda over l. That's lambda over l. That is 1 over lambda l. It could be. Definitely it has to go to 0 yeah. as l goes to infinity. Yes. It does. I, I haven't thought carefully about which one will work. It doesn't matter. In both cases, del squared s is much, much smaller than uh, del s by. Uh, but you're right. It might, might be one by lambda. Okay. Now this is approximately uh, k squared, and this is approximately like derivative of k. So if this is much, much less than this. What does it mean? It means that lambda. The radiation of lambda is much smaller uh, compared to over L square, which is uh, much greater than lambda. Exactly, the fractional variation. Let's let's get that straight. Um, so we have um, one by k squared del k is much much less than one, approximately. Now one by k squared is like lambda squared. Okay, so uh, this is like lambda del del. It's k lambda del. What am I saying? It's k lambda by k del k is much much less than one. I've written this uh, lambda squared as lambda by k. Stupid thing to do, but okay. Uh, uh, the reason I've done this is that one by k del by del k is the same as del of log k. So lambda del of log k is much, much less than 1. Now the change in the logarithm of k is a physical thing. It tells you, it gives you a measure of the fractional variation of k. Lambda del by del lambda tells you how much that, vari how much that variation happens over length scale lambda. Okay. So this is the condition that the fractional change in one wavelength is small over distances of order wavelength. Uh, if you want, I can replace this by lambda. Doesn't make a difference. Fractional change of k is same as fractional change of lambda plus minus. You understand? So this approximation common to WKB approximations. Actually, what I'm doing here is the relativistic version of the WKB approximation. Okay, uh, it's the condition the WKB approximation or this geometrical optics approximation works when the change in lambda over over one lambda, the fractional change in lambda over one lambda is small. This is the rule worth remembering. It makes a lot of sense because you see, suppose over one wavelength, the wavelength changes by fifty percent then there's no sense in which it's moving at constant wavelength. OK, great. So now that we've got this condition, what, what the condition means clear, when this condition applies, what is our equation? 
our equation is del s the whole thing squared is equal to 0. No, sir. Which del? This del is just a derivative, but because there's a lambda multiplying, it's variation in over lambda. You see? The pure change in uh, the wavelength over one wavelength. Taylor theorem. Length scales up. Hmm. The fractional change over length scale lambda. Okay? Is this clear? When these conditions are satisfied, the equation is del s, the whole thing squared is equal to 0. Okay? We can analyze this equation, but just as a reminder, uh, since you probably studied this in your quantum mechanics course, we'll just, I'll just give you a quick reminder for what, how the same thing works for Schrodinger's equation. So this is a parenthesis. Okay? Schrodinger's equation is, you'll have to help me with the sign, that is i minus i d by dt, no h bars. Uh, psi is equal to, uh, let's say, minus del squared psi plus v psi. Look at the motion of a particle in some potential. Okay, I'm not put keeping h bars and so on. Just get thank you. clear. Uh, okay, now suppose uh, we make the same approximation. Uh, just the minus what? Just the minus thank you. Thank you. Okay, fine. Okay, uh, now uh, uh, we we make the same approximation. We say psi is equal to e to the pi s. And once again, we drop the del squared term in s. What do we get? We can get the condition i right del s by del t. No, no, plus uh, uh, the two i's uh, minus. Yeah. Minus del s by del t, okay, uh, is equal to. Now here this was minus, and then we got another minus, so there was a plus del s by del uh, x i the whole thing square plus v is equal to yeah. Okay? Confusion? Something confusing? Del pi squared, this one? Oh, we're looking at a, min a massless minimally, cu minimally coupled scalar field as a proxy for looking at Maxwell's equation. Uh, we wanted to study the motion of photons in space state. Maxwell, we should really be doing this analysis for Maxwell's equations, but it's a pain because we have to keep track of polarization. Okay, so I'm doing it for a minimal, massless minimally coupled scalar field. Apart from polarization information, it's the same for the Maxwell. Actually, if you do this for the Maxwell theory, you also get how the polarization varies. Okay, but I'm not going to go through that exercise. Is, is this clear? Okay, so uh, this is what is called the Hamilton-Jacobi equation of classical mechanics. It's a statement of the equations of motion of classical mechanics. Uh, it's the Hamilton, it is the Hamil, you know, you remember that up to a sign, del s by del t on shell is the Hamilton. And del s by del xi is momentum. So this equation is simply the equation that h is equal to p squared plus v. And as all of you know, this is a, an autonomous way of formulating the equations of classical mechanics. You can try to find an S. Once you found that S, you can find particle motion through the procedure of Hamilton-Jacobi theory. I'll go through that procedure in the special case of the equation that we we're interested in at the moment. So the same procedure, which is called the WKB approximation in classical mechanics, leads you onto the Hamilton-Jacobi equation of class. Uh, sorry, in quantum mechanics, it leads you to the Hamilton-Jacobi of equation of classical mechanics. We're applying the same procedure, and in fact, this is the Hamilton-Jacobi equation for the motion of a free particle in the relativistic theory. But in the classical case, uh, 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 free, free massless particle. Yeah, sorry. So in the classical case, uh, uh, this is uh, so this semi-classical limit. I mean, this is obtained when 
uh, the age bar goes to, goes to zero. So the corresponding quantity in uh, iconal equation in gravity is uh, when gravity is weak enough. Yeah, you see, once again in the class, in the quantum case, all that is needed is that the wavelength of your excitation, the uh, rate, the change in the wavelength, the fractional change in the wavelength over one wavelength is small. Now that is guaranteed in the limit h bar goes to 0 because the wavelength goes to 0 in that limit. Okay? Yeah. But that, that's not the good way of saying it. The good way of saying it is here. We can scale h bar out of the equation. You know, This is the good way of saying it. The good way of saying it is that it works provided you're looking at solutions such that the change, fractional change in the wavelength over one wavelength is small. The intuition once again here is as follows. Had this been a free particle, we would have had e to the power i k dot x solution. So over little regions where the potential is not varying very much, the solution should be of the form e to the power i k dot x. It's just that the value of k will change as the, as the potential changes. Okay? So if you look for k much larger than the length scalar variation in this case in the, of your potential, once again, you should get e to the pi k dot x kind of solution. And it leads to this. Okay? So it's basically the classical mechanics emerges as the geometrical optics of the Schrodinger equation. Okay? So this is simply the, the Hamilton Jacobi equation for a massless particle. If we were studying a massive particle, we would have had plus m squared. <laughs> because this is the equation p squared is equal to 0. The, the appropriate equation for a massive particle would be p squared plus m squared is equal to zero. Okay, all very simple. Okay, so now we've got, we've got this equation, and you see from many points of view that it's right. How does the temperature of the p squared plus m squared is equal to zero? Well, let's see our sign convention. Yes, this is minus p zero squared plus p i squared plus m squared is equal to zero. Okay. Great. Fine. So now we've got this equation and we want to understand it. What does it mean? So we've got some equation that apparently tells us how photons move. But what is this? What is the relationship between this equation and what we always say? That it moves along uh, analogy of d6. Okay? So let's look at it. The first thing. Uh, is we will now interpret what that equation means. If del s, the whole thing squared, is 0, what does it mean? It means that surfaces of constant s are null manifolds. Okay. So what that equation is saying is that the solutions to this equation foliate space time into a set of null manifolds. For every constant s, we get a null manifold. Okay. And now something should click, because we've all studied null manifolds in great detail. One of the things that you remember is that the generator of a null manifold, and I'm going to prove it, it was an exercise that you guys have all long submitted it, I'm sure, so we can prove it now in class, that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that uh, the generators of a null manifold obey the massless view of d6 equation. Let's, let's check that. What are the generators of a null manifold? The generators of a null manifold are a normal vector, del mu s. Remember that del mu s was in the direction of the manifold itself, because it is a null manifold. Now, let's call this k mu, like we did here, for obvious reasons. Del mu s is k mu in that local coordinate patch. Okay? I want to know, is it true that k dot del of k mu is equal to 0? Is this true? If it were true, then it would mean that the generators of this null manifold obey the massless GOD6, uh, obey the GOD6 equation. Is this clear? Okay. Now this is this is true, and it's very easy to prove that because this is del mu s. Uh, let's put it up here. Del mu s times del mu s times sorry, del alpha. Del alpha s times del mu, uh, sorry, times 
Del Alfa, del Mi West. Might well, have just substituted what came here. But since S is a scalar, I can interchange the derivatives with no penalty because R, because the scalar is in the trivial representation. So R, R is action on the trivial representation of these. Okay, so this is del alpha, alpha S times del mu, del alpha S. But this is the same as del mu of del alpha S, the whole thing squared, by 2. Which we know is 0. It's 0 everywhere. So it's derivative of 0. I've chosen a clever normalization for my for my k mu. That's the normalization in which we get actually 0. So it's like I find value actually still. And if you chose another normalization, you wouldn't get 0, you would get something proportional to k mu. Okay? So what we see is the following. Firstly, we see something interesting. We see that there is a connection between solving the equation del, del mu s is equal to 0, del mu s squared is equal to 0, and finding null geodesics. Because if you solve this equation, then along every line of constant s, I can't draw this picture very well. You should imagine space-time is being foliated into surfaces of constant s. And each of these surfaces of constant s is foliated by its generators, gud6 along its gradient. So by, the, by this, by this, uh, um, by this procedure, we have filled, we have taken space-time and filled it with a congruence of null gud6. You see? Because each surface of constant s is a union of congruence of null gud6. And then we, the same is true for every s. So we've got a space-time filling congruence of null gud6. Now that we have this, it's very easy to argue that, you know. Uh, space-time uh, congruence of null gud6, uh, some manifold filling, not full space-time, right? Well, some so manifold. Uh, some manifold, but then for every sub-manifold. And therefore, space-time filling. Okay? I mean, it's like saying that uh, in, uh, uh, to use the example of Churchill, that uh, at R equals M, uh, for different M parameters, they fill the whole, uh, 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 the whole space. Uh, th that's not such a great analogy because for different M parameters, we're getting different manifolds. I see. Here we've got a single manifold. Hmm. On that single manifold, at different values of S, I, uh, yeah. we fill all of this. Right. Okay? Great. Uh, all the is exactly. Del mu s is, is null. Because the equation is del s squared is equal to 0 everywhere. Exactly. Is this clear? So you see, every time you solve that equation, you also end up solving the geodesic equation, and not for one geodesic, but a whole family of geodesics. Now, the last thing to show is that actually, so, you know, wave packets built out of such solutions actually move along the six. But this is sort of clear. In order to see this, it's the same proof as, in order to see this, let's, let's look locally. Because all of this works well, locally you can go to a little coordinate patch. Uh, so what about the space? Yes. So we've solved this equation, and we found that the solution involves lots of null geodesics. But I still want to show you that the photon moves along the null geodesics. Where have I shown that? What I've shown you is some, some solution of this equation, which the solution is non-zero all over space. The photon's not very localized. I'm interested in localized solutions. Okay. This, of course, all of you know how to deal with. It's like in free quantum mechanics, we've got solutions like e to the power i k dot x. Maybe plus i k squared, or maybe minus i k squared by 2 uh, t. This solution is all over, the, all over the place. How do you go from here to solutions that move by the classical equations of motion? You take weight packets. Right, what do you do? You do integral g of k times this. OK, 
okay, let g of k have a real path that's centered uh, around k naught. We could deal with the imaginary part, but for simplicity, let's say the imaginary part is zero. Okay, so let g of k be a real wave packet that is centered around k naught. And then we use the stationary phase approximation. In the stationary phase approximation, we differentiate this with respect to k. Uh, so, uh, so derivative with respect to any of the k's, so let's say k i, this is x i, i times x i minus, oops, minus i times k i t is equal to 0. And so the wave packet moves according to the equation x i is equal to k i t. If I kept h bars, there would have been some h bar somewhere because del squared had two h bars, this had one h bar. So there would have been some h bar somewhere, this would have made it momentum. And we would have got x is equal to, and if I kept masses, there would have been momentum by mass. You know, actually, we would get x is equal to vt, the classical motion. Okay? So we just do the same thing here. Locally, s is k dot x. Okay? Uh, locally, x is equal to k dot x. And therefore, uh, locally, uh, what? Okay, and so suppose we've got a wave packet centered around some k naught. Okay, what we have is that delta k dot x must be zero. By by variation, the principle of least action. Okay, but delta k dot is zero. There's only one vector with which dotted with respect to which it's zero, namely k it's itself. itself because k is always an alvex, which is that equation. And so x mu locally goes like k mu, is proportional to k mu, which is the statement that k mu is the tangent for motion of, of the particle. And remember, we're all doing this all infinitesimally. So this is really delta x mu, the change in x mu. Okay. So what we're saying is that if we take <coughs> not one of these solutions, but a family of such solutions, make a wave packet out of that, just like you would with, uh, make a wave packet out of e to the pi k dot x, okay? And you can take this wave packet and make it peaked. Then the wave packet will move along the geodesic. So if, if you constantly move in the k mu direction, you're moving along your, uh, your geodesic. Okay, and so we have deduced A, that photons defined by solutions to the equation del square phi is equal to zero. You know, not by a particle picture, by, but by, by a wave picture. Okay, move along null geodesics. And moreover, we have also shown that the effective k mu, the effective wave vector of the photon, obeys the geodesic equation. Okay. So you can use that to predict how the frequency of the photon changes as it moves along some path. Is this clear? This was a leftover piece from our discussion long ago. I promised to talk about it and then we never got around to it. So, uh, is this clear? Any questions? Excellent. But even now we get the variation of k mu. Because k mu obeys the equation. K dot del k is equal to zero. So k mu is that is the not the tangent vector of the null geodesic. So you solve the null geodesic equation. We get that exactly. So we we find the frequency and so in particular you may want to know how does where you know, we, in many special situations, we worked out this redshift business, stationary space times and so on. We even had a couple of problems on it. But you might want to know in complete generality, if I've got a photon moving along, how does it, okay, it moves along some path, 
but how does its frequency change as it moves around? You know, it's the tangent, the frequency is the tangent vector to the null geodesic signal. I mean, the frequency momentum moment is the tangent vector to the null geodesic signal. Okay, so the change of k is governed by the signal. Is this clear? Okay, so this is the most general rule for how uh, for how the photon, including keeping track of its local frequency, moves along motion. This rule we haven't gone through before, so I thought we would. This is approximate. It's true. It's approximate in the sense that it only works when the when you can talk about. You see, of course, it's approximate because the actual process of motion of photons is governed by the wave equation, by Maxwell's equation. To actually know what happens, you have to solve Maxwell's equation. We're trying to get away by solving some, pretending this thing is a particle. So clearly that's approximate. Where that idea works, that you can get away by treating this as a particle, classically, this is true. Where that idea is wrong, you have to, do, you have to change your formula. Yes. 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 This k mu is omega k, the usual four vector of the Markov particle. Is this clear? Okay. It's clear that that's the case because, see, that's what it was. Del mu s was the guy that was k dot x locally. A any other questions? Great. Okay. So this was clearing up operation number one. If you are consider, if you consider the second order in this part of it, yes. Then, then you will get corrections. You that, okay, it, it will get corrected. And oh, definitely will get corrected. And it's just will not remain the geodesic. Will not remain the geodesic anymore. It is even for massless. Particles. Even for massless particles. It will get some correction. Okay, this is very similar to the fact that the WKB approximation in quantum mechanics is a systematic approximation. It gets correction. This is very similar to this. And if the issue often gets very uh, high energy with the wave, then you see the motion of the particle, then it will not follow the theory. But that is. I didn't understand that. Say that again. It gets corrected, yes. There will, but it only gets corrected when the wavelength of your particle and the wave and the length of variation of your the curvature. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because that's a parameter. Be corrected in lambda by L. So in the case that this is much smaller than that, the correction is negligible. <coughs> okay? Great. Now we have a second clearing up operation to do. Namely, the discussion of angular momentum in general relativity. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you, you really there is this formalism developed, but uh, the nicest way of thinking, looking at this, is using this formalism developed by Wald. But we don't have the time to go through it. So, I'm going to just do some cheating. I'll give you a formula that I'll motivate, but without. Well, you see. The starting point is a reminder of something we've already seen in our discussion of the ADM formalism. Okay, uh, and the reminder is as follows: um, you might remi remember that we had a formula for the Hamiltonian of the solution on shell Hamiltonian. Okay, and our on shell Hamiltonian minus eight pi h was equal to integral n times k minus integral n a k a b minus k h a b times square root sigma uh, 
square in this case called the RB. RB times square root sigma. Let me remind you what all this means. This we derived in class. Um, K was the trace of the extrinsic curvature of, you remember what we had? We have this, the space time with a boundary at infinity, a time like boundary. And in this ADM formalism, we have these constant t slices. Everyone remembers this, right? With these constant t slices as a distinguished coordinate t. We started the ADM formalism by choosing a sli sli slicing of space time. OK? Uh, k is a two dimensional. Exactly. K, now, this, this boundary, the intersection of this boundary with the slice of space time gives you a boundary of the slice of space time. And little k was the extrinsic curvature of the boundary of the slice of space time, thought of as a two dimensional submanifold in this three dimensional manifold. Three dimensional, uh, purely three dimensional space. Spatial manifold. Spatial manifold. Do you remember how that came about, by the way? Yeah. There was a term in the Einstein equation, th uh, in the Einstein action, that was actually a. Uh, so this uh, term is of the boundary. Of the, 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 the square root k of the whole boundary. And then there was a bulk term in Einstein's equation. Then we did the uh, d, 3 plus 1 decomposition of that bulk term. And we were able to write it in terms of nice terms in 3, di three plus a surface term. And that first term plus the surface term combined to give. Yeah, modified this. Modified it and became the extrinsic curvature of the boundary on the spatial slice. Then, that was true even when we worked with the action. Then the next step, if you remember, what we did is that we went to move, we moved to the Hamiltonian. And in that, there was a new surface term. And this was a new surface term. Okay? This surface term here was, this k is the extrinsic curvature of the spatial slice in the full four-dimensional manifold. Any, does everyone, anyone remember what any is? It is a, in a chip function. Right. We had ds squared was equal to? Minus n squared dt squared. Minus n squared dt squared plus, plus by a plus n a dt, no, uh, by b plus n b dt. This was our 3 plus 1 decomposition of space time. So that's the basic way we decompose space time using the ADM formalism. OK? And then when we actually wanted uh, worked out our formula for the Hamiltonian in general relativity, the energy in general relativity, we said that we're interested in you know, space time that's asymptotically flat. So and we chose Na at the boundary to be 0 and n to be 1, so that our time was actually genuine time. And so for the Hamiltonian, only this term was needed with n be, being replaced by 1. OK? Now, I'm not going to give you a derivation. I'm just going to give you, tell you what the answer is. But it's sort of not too unintuitive. You see, one way of thinking of this is that n and na, in some rough sense, form a four-way. In some sense, it's true yeah. it's because there's particular time slicing. And yeah. Okay. And what we're doing to get the energy is to working with the four vector, which corresponds to time translation, which is n that's equals one, that's d by dt, and n a all equal to zero. Now, you see, it's a general fact in physics that conserved quantities are associated with uh, symmetries. In general relativity, symmetries are associated, as we know, with killing vectors. OK? So d by dt was half a killing vector. Yes. That's why it's not too unnatural in this formula. We choose n equals 1, and n is equal to 0. In fact, that's, if you think about it, that's what we want, because we wanted our slicing to reduce to time. 
That's why we chose n equals 1. And n a, n a is equal to 0. Now, suppose you have the conserved charge with respect to some other killing vector. Maybe we'll get the right formula. This needs a derivation. I'm not going to give it to you. Okay. So maybe we'll get the right formula if you just replace n and n a by, by the appropriate killing vector. Now, the appropriate killing vector of angular momentum is the rotation killing vector. Del by del phi. Okay, so if we did that, this term won't contribute because n should be zero. Yeah, it's not the time direction, but this term will contribute. You just substitute n a is equal to the vector del by del phi. We're at infinity. Okay, n a is del by del phi. Uh, this is a guess; it turns out to be the right guess. You know, a good way to actually go through this is this wall formalism. Uh, which if we had more time for would be good to go through, but we don't at this point, it's in very near the end of the course. So I'm just going to ask you to take this as a, pl a plausible, a plausible justification, okay? So the formula for angular momentum is um, <coughs> J A is equal to, um, okay, let's call it J phi is equal to n phi, n phi a k a b minus k h a b r b square root sigma v 2 p time, where n phi a is the vector, the killing vector corresponding to phi rotations. Integral over, Integral over two dimensional manner, the two dimensional boundary. OK, this is the induced metric on the boundary. RB, this was the normal to the, um, to the, to the boundary. OK, now what we are going to do is to use this formula. This is correct formula. Correct formula, this is a minus pi minus. This is the correct formula, it turns out. In for more serious analysis. Okay, uh, we're going to use this formula in uh, reasonable circum uh, uh, for particular kinds of metrics. The kind of metric that was that we found in curl geometry. Okay, to evaluate the angular momentum of uh, in the end the curved space time, but for uh, for a larger class of space times. Is this clear? This is what we, this is what we're going to try to do. Okay. So if you look at the curve metric, which we will look at uh, in order to identify the parameters, uh, <coughs> but if you look at the curve metric. We'll do that in a minute, uh, more seriously. But you will see that at infinity, it takes the following, following form. We already checked in the last class that at leading order, it went to flat space. Yes. Okay. The first subleading corrections are proportional to 1 over r. And in particular, take the following form. 1 minus 2m by r dp squared plus 1 plus 2m by r into sorry hello huh hello yeah hi spenta Oh, I'm really sorry I forgot to call you. Spent I'm teaching a class immediately after that I'll call you. Is that okay? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uh, 
Uh, after we go through this analysis, I'll rewrite the curve in entry, and we will expand it out that large R and check that it takes us. Okay? D T D phi. D T D phi. This is sorry. Yeah. Okay. This is the metric for something with angular momentum in the d by d phi court. Okay. Now I want to. We have already gone through the exercise. I don't remember whether we did it in class or you guys had it as a problem. To check in such a metric that m was the mass given by that formula. Okay, we've already gone through this exercise. What I want to now do is to check that the angular momentum given by this formula here is j. Okay, so that is the practical way of reading off the angular momentum. In a, in a space time like this, you take the space time, expand it at large r in this form, and the, co the coefficient, just like the coefficient of dt squared, 1 minus 2m by r, is, uh, um, uh, is the, uh, 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 the mass. In the same way, the coefficient, you look at the coefficient of dt d phi, and from that you can read off j. Okay. Um, fine. So, in order to do this, uh, what do we need? What we want to do is to evaluate. Um, uh, what we want to do is to evaluate this k a b. Okay. Now you see, this w what we're doing. Our slices are going to be. Our slices are going to be slices of constant t. Okay, so this k, a, b, and k are going to be k, a, b, and k of slices of constant t. <coughs> okay, now it will turn out that k, b, and k are by themselves, you know, small enough in the sense that they are one. You, you know that k, b, and k in flat space are just zero. Yeah. Okay, so this k, b, and k will all get contributions from this one over r. Okay, and um, it will turn out as we will see that it's this one over r will saturate. Will give you something. Finite as we go to infinity. So, uh, just one question. So, there's no counterterm subtraction as in the case of. There's no counterterm subtraction because a flat space has zero angular moment. Yeah. Okay, because if you evaluate this, this formula on flat space, you'll oh, get. Oh. No, no, we are still evaluating in flat space. No, we're evaluating in, in uh, arbitrary space time. Mm -hmm. But the counterterm subtraction was to get rid of the, the contribution the of. Term. Which was a contribution that was non zero even in flat space. I in flat space, okay. and therefore there's no need for a counter term. Okay, so uh, we will see that the one by r dependence from k, b, and k is the r dependence needed to give you something finite as uh, as uh, r goes to infinity. Okay, we'll see that as we go along, and therefore, in order to, we don't need to worry about corrections in this, this, and this. We can treat all of these as if they were the quantities evaluated just in pure flat space. <laughs> okay? Therefore, N A, okay, um, N A phi, okay, so N A is equal to D by D phi. And N A. Okay, let me maybe uh, write it as this way. N A uh, D dot D D P dot D dot P phi right. What? D D D D D P dot D dot uh, D D phi. N A. And N, N A. Let, let me maybe write it in this in the in T R theta phi. Its components. Oh yeah, I see. Ah, zero 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 one. 
when you have an yeah, upper uh, because we just chose that we've question. chosen that and yeah. yeah, yeah, na therefore is equal to 0 0 0 1 by r square because uh, no and 1 by r square uh, sine squared theta because the metric has a r squared sine squared theta d pi squared okay what about r a this r b r a in the same um, parametrization is 0 1 0 0 just this yeah del by del just con yeah. constant r okay and r a is also 0 1 0 0 because at infinity we've got dr square okay and what about this this surface area that surface area is simply sine square theta d theta d phi times r square. Okay. Yes. We, N is a choice of which killing vector is. You see, you remember we got this and then we interpreted the formula of angular momentum. Finally, in the end, this angular momentum had nothing to do with the ADMD domain. K was geometrical and N was the killing vector corresponding to rotation. Okay? So this N is not about the metric, it's just about the choice of killing vector. From this end, yes. Uh, in flat plane. If we calculate n t, there will be n lower case. There will be v lower case by n upper pi. Right. Then there may be a. There, 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 there may be a contribution. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm not sure. Uh, you see, that will be subleading because k will also have yeah. one over us. So it will not contribute, I think. But maybe I'm wrong, and then we'll come back and check it. I think we'll just get everything from this leading stuff. If, if we have to be more careful, we'll come back and do that. Okay? So let's, let's go. Now what remains is to calculate these two quantities, Kb, K and Hab. <coughs> okay? I believe that once again, you see Hab, okay. Uh, this is basically d by d phi. This is basically d by d r. So this is like h r phi. Yeah. And so uh, furthermore, k a b will be just some constant times h a b, wouldn't it? Oh, constant times? Uh, h a b, k a b. Uh, no. Well, uh, two, two dimensional manifold. No, well, it's a three dimensional. It's the k is the k on the full spatial slice. It's okay. a manifold of constant t. We'll evaluate KAB in just, just a minute. But this is going to be zero, because to the order we're keeping, there's no HRT term. OK? So everything will come from here. So basically, what we're going to get is K phi t. K phi t, maybe we want to lower and raise. So, so phi r, sorry. Let's, let's do K phi r. Okay, let's do k phi r, and then we will have uh, k phi r, and then we will have uh, n a, so that's just one, uh, yeah. So basically, we, we're going to get just k phi r times integral sine square theta d theta d phi uh, times r square. 
I just, it's a bit more convenient to compute an extrinsic curvature with lower indices than with upper indices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what is the extrinsic curvature? Extrinsic curvature is del mu n mu plus del mu n mu by 2 and then project. This thing projected. I mean, the projections are going to be lower order. So, what, what, we, what we want is basically del r n phi, okay, plus del phi n r. Now let's look at this del r n phi. n phi itself is 0. So one term is just del r of n phi, but that's 0. Right? But there might be a term that is gamma r phi r. Oh, no, no, r t. Because n is dt. Gamma r phi t. Okay? Similarly, del phi of n, n r is 0. So there can be a term that is, uh, and this is by 2, uh, which. So I assume of that term, I just move here. Exactly. This is the same thing. Gamma phi r, which is same as n r phi t. So it's basically the computation of this term. Is this clear? OK. Now, where is this non-zero? Exactly. Exactly. Where do we get anything non-zero from, from here? We get something non-zero from the term, which is g t um, t. And then there were all the all the terms, right? So we, when we put a t here, OK? But the t phi term will be the one that's important. So del r of g t phi by 2. OK? Now, g t phi is already 1 by r. So del r of that is 1 by r square. But so that's. But uh, g t phi is also there. So then in upper g t phi and then del r of the phi term. Well, you, you are suggesting there should be another term as well? Yes. Yeah, those are all terms. Okay. And this, this is, you see, we, we're going to. Everything here, we're keeping everything else leading, just differentiating the gt phi. That already gives us 1 by r square. Now we have an r square here. Any further 1 by r will just go up to, in, to 0 at infinity. OK? So this is the only term that survives. Outside, we can't have any gt phi. No, no. Yeah, subleading. And here, in gtt, we must just take the leading, which is minus 1. OK? So this quantity is equal to uh, minus 4j. Now, the minus signs, oh, I'm not sure. The minus signs are plus gtt. GTT. And then there's also a derivative, which is 1 by r. And then uh, and there was a minus sign here. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> up to sign. <laughs> OK. Uh, we have 4j by r squared, but then the r squared cancels. Then. <coughs> Um, sine squared theta uh, sine squared theta by uh, that's it 4j sine squared theta d theta d phi there was a sine squared theta in the middle you're right Thank you. OK. And uh, this was 8 pi j, so we should divide the whole thing by an 8 pi. OK. 
So now we have to evaluate. OK, let's see if we are able to do that. Uh, first important thing is that's clearly proportional to u. Second important thing is that it's constant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now is that constant 1? Uh, I mean, is this basically 8 pi? Let's see. The d phi integral gives us 2 pi. 2 pi, I, I mean, it, it would be 1. Right? So integral sign, I've made, I messed up somehow. Sign to the power theta, d theta. Now, uh, this is whatever it is. Uh, let me just check if how do you get the one. Some extra factors of three size. Just, just. They found gamma t phi r is equal to 3j sine square theta by r square. Oh, so by the way, it's also this will be sine cube theta because the integration measure is uh, r square sine theta. Ah, theta. very good, very good point, very good, very, very good point. And this will be sine cube theta. Thank you. <laughs> sine cube theta is also what they're getting. So that's great. But they have an additional factor of 3 somewhere. Yeah, sine cube theta, I think that will give us 3. That will, this gives a 3 because sine cube theta. Is sine theta is 1 by the sine square theta. Exactly. This integral we can easily do because that's yeah. integral d cos theta yes. in a 1 minus cos squared. Yeah. Okay, so, let's, let's, so that's 1 minus x squared into dx. Yeah. So this gives, um, and this cos theta runs uh, from? Minus 1 to 1. Minus 1 mm. to 1. Oh, uh, oh. 1 minus x squared dx to minus 1 to 1. 0 to 1. 0 to 1. Uh, so, uh, because theta runs from 0 to this, uh, 0 to pi, cos theta is Yeah, no, you're right. Minus. You're right, you're right. Minus 1 to 1. Minus 1 to 1. So, so this guy was 2, and this guy was minus 2 by 3. Right? So we get uh, 2 into 2 by 3 is 4 by 3. But they computed gamma tr with an extra, t let, me, let me just see. So we've messed up some, I've messed up somewhere, just let me get the, uh, let me get the. Ah. Ah, 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 ah. May, maybe this is one of the things you were missing. Sorry, I, I, I missed. Let, let me just more seriously compute this gamma. Sorry. I, uh, let me more seriously compute this gamma t phi r. I think this is roughly what you're missing. Um, OK, let me be more serious about that. So what I want is gamma t phi r. OK, I'll just write it out exactly. And then we'll carefully see what contributes about that. So this is equal to g t mu by 2. And then g phi mu r 
plus G uh, R mu pi minus G uh, pi R. OK, let us carefully compute this. We are interested in anything that goes 1 by r squared, like, like 1 by r squared. There should be nothing that goes more slowly than uh, 1 by r squared. Anything that goes like 1 by r squared, we're interested in. Anything that goes like 1 by r cube or higher, we forget about. OK, so let's see. Firstly, nothing in the metric depends on phi. So this is not good. OK, now w the metric depends on, let's be careful, it depends on theta and r. OK, so we, w we have the g c theta, um, which is 0, exactly. Yeah, exactly, that's right. It's, it's zero. Okay, so uh, well, in this term, the only thing that can appear is an R, right? So we have uh, G T R by two minus G T R by two G phi R comma R. G T R is zero. G T R. Uh, You're right. It's only in phi and G T T and G T phi. G T T and G T phi. Um, okay. So it looks like what we did was right, right? Do you see any other contribution? Uh, I think in the Christopher paper, we neglected the factor of half. Okay. We need yeah, that. Half. But he's got a factor of three. So factor of three comes from our four thirds. Well, four thirds, but he, he's got a cancelling factor of three. Oh. In, <laughs> uh, he claims, let me read out, he claims that g t phi is equal to 2j by r cube. No, sorry, gamma, so what where, where am I saying? Gamma three, t phi is equal to minus 3j sine square theta by r square. So, huh? I think that the, the g t phi will confirm will Which one is that? Oh, earlier we did only g t t term. We I did. Mean, uh, upper, upper g t t term. Earlier, we okay. took only upper g t t term and meeting order, we kept Minus one, uh, g t t upper. Okay. This, uh, phi upper. The, this just doesn't contribute to this, you agree? Uh, so g t phi, g phi by r is zero, obviously. G, when you take on the first term contribution. First term, yeah. So this term I can throw away? Uh, yeah, for the g t phi term, right? When mu is equal to phi. When mu is equal to anything, right? Because. Uh, uh, the only thing that G, the, oh, yeah, me, this me, you can throw. Throw. Yeah. So I can just get rid of this. Okay, so what, I, what I'm left with is this, and then there is G T mu by 2, G phi, okay, so let's say G T T, yeah. T R, plus G T phi, ah. T phi phi? Yeah, 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 yeah. This, this, this is the term I missed. Thank you by 2 g phi phi r. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. So good, 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 good. This is the term we calculated. Yeah. That's this here, we take the leading order here. Yeah. We, we calculated this. Now let's, let's calculate this guy. g phi phi is non-zero just because it's sine square theta. R, r square sine square. r square sine square theta. So it's derivative with respect to r is 2r, okay, uh, by 2, so this is g t phi, 
times times r. Sorry, sorry. R times. Ah, sine square theta. Sine square theta. Great. Yes. Now we need to calculate g t phi. So let's let's do that. So for that we need to so invert two two the two by two matrix. So the two by two matrix was minus one for g t t. Um, uh, so, but sub leading. yeah. 2j by r sine square theta. 2j by r sine square theta. With a minus sign. And then finally, uh, phi phi was r squared sine square theta. Everything else presumably sub leading. OK. Great. So let's compute. Determinant is r squared to leading order. R squared sine squared theta. OK. And g t phi will be basically determined by one of these quantities. OK. So it will be up to some sign 2j by, by r uh, cube uh, sine sin squared theta. But the determinant also had a sine square theta cancels. So 1 over r cube, and then multiplying an r sine square theta. That looks good, except last time we had a yeah, sine cube. So, uh, so there uh, we missed two things. Uh -huh. that It's only half this quantity. I, I'm just worried that we had a sine square theta, where here we had a sine cube theta. No, sine oh, theta, that sine square theta. Ah, because of the sine theta, yes. Yeah. OK, excellent. Fine, fine, so fine. Then three, is three is coming. Excellent. Two plus one. I'm OK, totally happy. Sorry, sorry for the mess up. <laughs> OK, so there was a three there, a one by three in the integral. You do it carefully, you'll get. Yeah. OK, I'm, I'm not going to. I'll just leave it as an exit. I, I'm going to ask you to fi fix up the uh, the coefficients as an exercise. Exercise. Uh, compute the angular momentum in that case. With sides. Okay. So the final rule was that we expand ds squared in this form. And then j is the angular momentum. OK. Fine. Now let us use this to evaluate the angular momentum of the curve solution we had. So, OK, this is a bit tricky. Anyway, uh, the curve metric, let us remember, ds squared was equal to, uh, just want it in this form, OK, minus 1 minus 2 m r by rho squared dt squared minus For m a r sine square theta divided by rho squared hmm. plus sigma by rho squared sine square theta d phi squared. So, uh, what was uh, this metric? I no. Uh, this was d t d phi. Uh, plus uh, rho squared by delta dr squared plus rho squared d theta squared. 
where rho squared was equal to r squared plus d squared cos uh, squared theta delta was equal to r squared minus 2 m r plus a squared and sigma is equal to r squared plus a squared or x squared minus a squared delta sin squared theta. Now let me see where he is given the answer so that we have something to compare with. But at large r, it will be effective. Uh, large r, this would, uh, but they're not the same coordinates. They're not the same coordinates, exactly. But yeah. OK. So we put to reduce to uh, that form at, uh, oh. in that limit. Yeah. So all we want, you see, all that we used in our derivation is actually for the getting the angular momentum, we use none of the other corrections. Yeah. All that we used was, was there was flat space hmm. plus 4j by r sine square theta dt dr. So all we have to do, you remember we already checked that we got flat space to leading order. Yes. All we have to do is to find the leading order correction to the dt d, d phi term of the metric. Okay? So that's very easy because um, rho squared at leading order was one by uh, was r squared. So to leading order, this is just minus dt d phi into four m a by r. Sin square theta. And then comparison with that gives us the answer. So J is, J is M. A. Actually, comparison with just the dt squared term. And remember, once again, rho is 1 by r squared. We'll give us the mass is equal to m. OK? So this curved black hole that we studied was a black hole of mass m, and j is equal to m. OK? Great. Now, there are many things we wanted to say about uh, about the this black hole, but let me leave. Um, this is the last set of exercises. Today I'll send you your problem set. So let me just leave many of these. These are just algebraic veri verifications now. I'll leave many of these things as just as uh, exercises. So exercise. Okay. OK. Now, you remember this, we had this property omega, which was what, what was a GTT by GT phi or something like that, that we defined last time. Omega was a function of r. And you remember that it was particularly interesting at r is equal to r plus. Hmm. So omega of r plus, we will call omega. OK. This is the it's sometimes called the angular velocity of the black hole. Okay? And I I I so exercise one is to verify the SMAR relation. Verify SMAR's formula.
k is kappa. I'll tell you what k is. It's the surface gravity. We've computed the mass. That's m. Okay. So the mass is m. Hmm. J we've computed. Omega we know. I have to tell you what a and k. Okay. What is a? A is equal to the area of the event horizon. Okay, now let us look at our form of the metric here. Okay, so we're taking a constant time slice of the event horizon, and we want to compute the area of that. So the event the uh, the event horizon was at r is equal to r plus. Okay, um, uh, and uh, delta was zero at that. Exactly, delta was zero at that point, and uh, delta have we got the formula? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just some function just of r, no theta or anything of that type. Okay. So it's some fixed r. So now what we have to do is to evaluate the uh, uh, we want constant t time t slice, constant t. So we just have a metric in. This is also not there. Yeah. Because that's dt. Uh, pi and uh, pi and theta. theta. So, but we've got the sigma here, and we've got the rho squared there. Yeah. So, we want to evaluate the area of this uh, uh, of this surface. Okay. So, um, in order to solve this exercise, okay. So, maybe we make this part. Only that will work up only for sigma, I think. What? I mean, this row, this row and that row cancel. This row and that row will cancel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, square root sigma. Exactly, a, a square root sigma, and then you've got to do some sort of integral yeah. over theta. Okay, so first thing, check that a is equal to four pi r plus square plus a square. Okay. So the area of the event horizon is this. And now I also have to tell you about this kappa. This kappa is something that is called the surface gravity. Okay? And is defined by the following formulas. I'm cleaning this. Okay, uh, maybe there's an, another. Part. Okay, this exercise was if we take the killing vector, check that. is null at the horizon. And generates the horizon. The event horizon. What do you, what do you have to do to check the second, second thing? Do you understand that? You see, the norm. Uh, uh, we have to at first calculate the norm of uh, this vector at. Uh, the first part is straightforward. Yeah. You compute the norm of this vector and check that it's zero. But secondly, I want you to check that it's not only a null vector, but it's the generator of the event horizon. So that KMU dot uh, del uh, KMU. Uh, uh, right. So wh wh uh, what? Uh, oh, at least up to normalization, that it agrees with the generator. Uh, uh, up to normalization. Okay. 
what do we have to check? You see, what is the normal vector for the event horizon? The normal one form is dr, because the event horizon is the surface, r is equal to constant. So the normal one form is dr at r is equal to r plus. Now if we want the vector dual to this generator, the vector mu components, v mu is equal to g mu r, because you raised at r is equal to r plus. So you have to check that g mu r at r is equal to r plus is proportional to this vector. OK? It is actually a general property, and I don't know if we'll have the time to go through this in no. later classes. It's a general property of stationary black holes that it's always true that there is a killing vector field in space time that reduces on the event horizon to the generators of that black hole. Uh, it looks like if you have only one component, which is new, uh, could, uh, that could be, uh, ah, OK, I see. Well. Yeah, but, uh, the, this has only the uh, R component, because uh, uh, that, uh, in R, that is diagonal. Wait, wait, we don't look at that. Up, yeah. Metric, that metric? Yeah, we should look at the exact curve metric. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about the uh, exact curve metric. I mean, there's no uh, dr, uh, only dr squared. There's no dr, d phi, dr, dt. Uh huh. There's no dr. Yeah, I mean, that's. You guys, how is that working? You ask it. Uh, let, let me look at the exact metric. So that's gone. OK. Yeah, how is this super? Just one. Just a minute. I was reading that wrong. Yeah, you know, you know, in order to see this, you can't use this form of the metric because this form of the metric is singular at the uh, at the event horizon. Let's let's work it out for Schwarzschild. You would have actually had add the same objection there because uh, okay. L uh, let me quickly work this out for Schwarzschild for you, and you'll see what what you left. Okay, there the statement is simpler. It is the statement that, yeah, so what, what I said wrong, was wrong here was d by dt. It was actually d by d v. Uh, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me work this out for short. You see, d by dt is a singular vector at the horizon. Yes. But suppose I look at the future event horizon. Yeah. Suppose I look at the future event horizon, then the Schwarzschild metric takes the form ds squared is equal to uh, 2 dv dr minus f of r dv squared plus r squared blah blah blah. Okay? 
Now, let us look at the vector d by dv, which is well behaved, which is well behaved at the event horizon. At the event horizon, this guy is 0. So the metric is entirely 1, 1, 0, 0. And so if you take dr, gr mu, it's purely in the v direction. So agreeing with it, d by dv. Okay? So you will have to do a similar sort of exercise. And some ingoing And some ingoing kind of coordinates. Okay? Yeah. Maybe I'll do that in class for you next. In next class, we'll have to move coordinates to do it. But let me go back to that. that uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I need to define this k for you. And for that, I need the killing vector. Okay, let's postpone the exercise next class. Let me give you a definition of this kappa, and then I'll give you a set of exercises. To do that. Okay, actually, maybe I'll list the exercises, and we, the exercises will make sense after I've defined kappa next, ne next class. Let me <laughs> finish <laughs> listing the exercises. Uh, where, where, where were we? Uh, okay, I, I had still to tell you what kappa is. Okay, I'll tell you about that next class. But subject to that, we've, we've checked this and checked this. Next exercise. Next exercise is is this one. Check that. Kappa by eight pi delta a. Delta M minus <coughs> this equation is sometimes so called. Uh, for which process? So this is a statement about stationary solutions. You have solutions labeled by M and A. Okay? So you can only change these solutions by either changing M or by changing A. And G. Well, G. J is M times A. Okay. Fine. So you have two variations. Fine. You can change A or you can change M. The claim is for I, either of these two variations. This is true. Just as an algebraic identity. Okay? Now this equation is taken to have a deep meaning. You see, this is the energy. This quantity we're going to associate with this is an angular velocity, which we're going to associate with the thermodynamic angular velocity, the chemical potential dual to, ro to uh, rotation, the angular momentum. Okay? And this reminds one of the formula TDS. Is equal to d minus omega dg. So this formula from thermodynamics that we will briefly review in the next class. Okay? And uh, indeed, what we are going to do is to, as we will, as I will try to explain, interpret S as A divided by 4. And T as this kappa which I have here defined for you by 2 pi. So we're going to associate a temperature and an entropy with black holes. We've already associated mass, angular velocity, and angular momentum. We're going to use this formula 
to associate a temperature and an entropy with black holes. And note that with this association, black holes obey the first law of thermodynamics. Okay? And then we will also show that in any physical process, A always increases. Since A is proportional to S, that will be a proof within the black hole context of the analog of the second law of thermodynamics. If we, if we had a little more time, we would go through this. We would uh, we would go through this beautiful calculation by Hawking, which showed that black holes radiate as if they were a temperature of kappa by two pi. Okay, but this stuff we're going to. Th this is the second exercise. We go through some of this. I won't check it for you. That's that's for you to do. But we go through some of the implications of this this formula. So I, I, I so in the next class we will start by defining kappa more carefully, and uh, uh, we go through some of the implications of these of these identities. Uh, we'll also check the area increase theorem. So I'll, I'll go through the area increase theorem. Okay. So in, in in the next class we will try to complete our abstract discussion of black hole physics. And then the remaining, maybe we'll have one or two classes next week, in which I'm not sure what we'll do. I don't. I thought we would try to look at uh, black holes rotating around each other, but that sounds overly ambitious now. We have very little time. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe we could just have a review. Maybe we could just. What we could do is to go through everything we've talked about, remind ourselves of everything we've talked about. So let, let's see. We'll, we'll see how that.